Yeah, what happens a lot of times, you get somebody on the phone and you know they have a problem you can solve and your gut says to yourself, oh, I, perf- I can help you. Let, let me show what I've got. And then you start just to unload on them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not saying, but you start to overeducate and give value. And, and then at the end of the call, they're like, wow, this is great. Let me think about it. And yeah. uh, we'll let you know. And you're like, what? Mm-hmm. I, I just, so, so my, uh, my ideas are very contrarian. My whole thought process is, is basically not to give value pre-sale, mm-hmm. but instead to provide clarity on their problem not value on the solutions. What I discovered was that potential clients don't care about how you solve their problem. What they care about is if you're the one to solve it or not. All right, Ari, we're live. How are you doing? Yeah. Or good morning Great. to you. Yeah, morning over here. Yeah, afternoon over there, I'm sure. That's yep. right. Yeah, it's always cool to talk to another guy that's lived in San Diego, at least for an extended period. You're in Sydney now. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Both sides of the world. That's right. And shout out to Perry Marshall, uh, you know, just thanking him for the intro. And uh, he's, he's intro quite some cool people to us recently. And, and yeah, and finally got you on the show. So um, yeah, maybe that's part of this. It'd be cool to hear kind of like some of the story with you and Perry. I know you guys go way back. Yeah, well, well, Perry and I actually met in Australia probably 15, 20 years ago, the first ever internet online seminar they had in this part of the world. And I was just moving here to my wife online on a dating site. I believe actually back then there wasn't any swiping at all. We just literally kind of talk, <laughs> talk dating, you know? And uh, so um, I went to, uh, I think, Coulomb, Australia here. So I went to a seminar. I just moved here and I met him there. And, and uh, I, 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 at a cocktail hour, I printed my homepage out and I brought him to like the homepage. <laughs> this is my homepage. <laughs> and I That's can't great. figure out why it's not converting. You're like, well, cross that out. Took a pen. And I, I'm like, okay, thanks. I back to my, my, my room and just made the change start to work. I'm like, okay, you got me. So I joined his bobsled run and uh, his original, you know, Google AdWords program and kind of won a prize there. And yeah. uh, I mentor ever since and we're, we're, we're friends now. And I just spoke at his last um, private group, client group nice. in San Diego last year. He's a cool guy. Yeah. yeah. Share a lot of cool, cool folks that have graced this, uh, graced this sure. show. <laughs> <laughs> but let's, uh, let's get into your, your story and, and kind of briefly walk us through, you know, what, how, what brought you here. I know it's all wrapped around sales and, and, uh, you know, having these interesting, you have a lot of strategies that are going to be cool to deep dive into. Yeah, sure. So I've uh, been out this, doing this for about 20 years now. I've got a whole philosophy in business called unlock the sales game. And essentially, I'll tell you the story behind it, which I think will resonate with. Uh, about 20 years ago, uh, I was a sales manager in a software company. And believe it or not, we were the first ones to launch the website, online website tracking tools like Google Analytics, hmm. tracking all the stats. We had the first one that actually built that little tool. And I was, so back then I was involved with that. And uh, I had a team underneath me of salespeople. And um, uh, my job was to kind of bring the big accounts in. So I got this one lead came across my desk. And it was a big, big company. You recognize the name and they have multiple websites. And I was like, wow, this is a huge deal. If I get this one deal, it would double the revenue in one year for the whole company. So you can imagine everyone's like, you know, are we good? You know, go for it. So if I land this deal, everyone gets a bonus pretty much at Christmas time. So the, no my pressure. contact agreed to a conference call, you know, to in a demo to see our product. So the day finally came, four o'clock in the afternoon, it was myself and my CEO in the conference room. We closed the door behind us. I closed the, the, the window shades a bit so like they couldn't look inside the team. And uh, so all, on the table was a speaker phone. The one with the three legs on it, the old corporate ones, you know, three yep. <laughs> speaker phones. Yep. So I, I dialed the number and my contact says, you know, hey, Ari. I said, hey, John, how's it going? Good. We started chatting a bit. He says, look, let me share with you, Ari, who we have on the call right now with us. So I was like, oh, great. Who do you have with it? Next thing I hear is, um, my name is Mike. I'm CEO. I was like, wow, CEO. This is a good person. <laughs> my name is uh, Steve. I'm head of IT. Oh, this is even better. You know, my name yeah. is Julian, head of marketing. This is like everybody on this call was basically a decision maker, mm-hmm. right? This is a call we hope to get as often as possible. So I was pretty jazzed about it. And I introduced myself and then gave them a live demo over the web, showing their, their website statistics live collected on one of their websites. We did in advance. And and I started to hear this noise in the phone call, like, wow, this is great. This is like early days, you know? <laughs> and they're like, oh my, this is amazing. I can't believe you can see all this information, this data. And they start asking me all kinds of questions, you know, how does it work? How does the tagging work and the technology? And I had all the answers. I was pretty competent back then. So I answered all the questions. And I mean, there was so much chemistry on this phone call, you guys. It was like, 
like a love fest on the phone <laughs> <laughs> from day one, second you one. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. It's like, yeah. oh, this is like, oh, thank you, God. I was like, I was, it could not been better. My boss is like, you know, high five in the corner over the shoulder. He's like, yeah, hey, nice job. And I'm I, I my calm self. I, I was a student of selling. I had the books at home and CDs in my car. And I'm answering objections. And um, an hour goes by. It was like the perfect sales call. It could not have been better. And the call comes to a close. And my guy says to me, Ari, this is great, man. This is, we love this. Give us a call a couple of weeks. Follow up with us. And we'll move this thing forward. Hmm. I said to myself, oh, oh, thank you. And uh, so I said my goodbyes and I took my arm and I'm reaching for the phone in the middle of the table as I'm reaching for the phone and I'm reaching for that off button by complete accident rather, rather than the off button, I hit the mute button instead. They were like right next to each other. <laughs> I hit the wrong button and a small click happened and they thought I hung up the phone. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, uh, what happened then? In that split second, a voice inside of me said, Ari, go to the dark side. <laughs> find the wall. Listen in. You know, we'll go and no one's ever gone before. So I, I literally just pulled my thumb back for a couple seconds. They started talking amongst themselves, thinking I had left the call. <laughs> so what, what, what would you imagine? I mean, this is not a trick question, but what do you imagine they would have said after a call like that? ideally man i really like that guy let's yeah. let's work with him yeah, <laughs> right exactly that's what you're supposed to be hearing right yep. sure for an hour but uh, i'll share with you what they said verbatim word for word i'll never forget it's why we're here today um what they said was this they said we're not going to go with him keep using him for more information and make sure we shop someplace else cheaper mm. knife and heart twist yeah. i was in a state of shock i hit the off button i looked at the wall said to myself what did i do wrong i was competent i gave value i answered objections and the first big epiphany hit me and that was this that somewhere along the way it has become socially acceptable not to tell the truth the people who sell hmm. right mm -hmm. it's okay to say things like sounds good send me information oh we're definitely what we're definitely Interested. Interested. Yeah. <laughs> Let's circle back. Let's any circle. intention of buying. Right. And then I asked myself, why were they afraid to just tell me the truth? I'm okay with the truth. And I realized that moment that there is like this invisible kind of flow of like pressure that flows underneath your sales process with a pre-sale with somebody. And unless you remove that pressure pre-sale, they'll always have their guard up and won't tell you the truth. You have to chase them to get what you need and play what I call the sales game. Mm -hmm. And that's where I went to my whole concept called the unlock the sales game mindset. Where your goal is not to focus anymore on the end goal of the sale, but your goal is to focus on the truth. And that became my whole philosophy and kind of revolution around how to change the way you think with a whole body of work around that, with languaging and processes. And that's the premise behind our whole philosophy is that you can make a lot more sales by focusing on trust and not the end goal of the sale at first. And that'll kind of change everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm curious, knowing, knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently on that call? Great question. I love that question. <laughs> okay, all the time. And the funny thing about that is the answer to that is that I never would have had the call. Mm. It's the pre-work, right? Because I would have got the truth in the beginning to have avoided the chasing, chasing process and chasing game. And that's what happens is we end up in this chasing game with people who tell us what they, we, we want to hear. We get seduced with that. We assume, oh my God, they're really interested. And then we get in this kind of chase mode and we start pursuing people and we kind of lose ourselves. And then we wonder, well, God, a huge pipeline. I got a few sales, but I'm doing well. I'm busy. I'm making lots of calls. I got a huge, a huge database, but nothing's happening. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's all that, uh, it's that pre-work, huh? That's so walk us through. Was that like, did you just change right then at the spot? Like, Oh, okay. Yeah. This is, I, I, kind of quit my, I quit my job. Like I've come home months later and I said to myself, man, I've got to craft a code on this. If I can change the whole industry in selling and help people stop chasing people, what a revolution in helping people get their human you know, humanness back and not degrade mm -hmm. themselves and not have to pursue people. And that kind of led to my whole kind of system of process where I basically challenged the whole notion of how we've been taught to sell after all these years from all the gurus who told us that our goal is to close a sale. Our mm -hmm. goal is to pursue someone. Don't give up. Don't be a wimp. Keep chasing. And I realized that whole 
that's a very dysfunctional process having to do that with people. But if you can get smart about this and build trust with them at hello, hmm. then, because my whole thing is a sale is lost at hello, not the end of the process. It's lost over here, not over here. But we always been taught to believe we lost it at the end when it was lost in the beginning. So my whole system and philosophy, I'll share with you some ideas today, is yeah. ways to engage people in the beginning of your process that builds trust from the beginning, not the end. Mm, amazing. So um, just want to make sure the listeners know, can we apply this all to online stuff, you know, selling their own products, affiliate products, all, deal, all that, that's all applicable here, right? Yeah, so all the language that you use, the language in your copy, in your mm. websites, in your ads, uh, it's all language, trust-based language. I've, I've developed a whole bunch of work around that. Plus, even if, you're, if your folks are doing online uh, marketing, but they actually have a phone call with a customer over the phone, that's a conversion point mm -hmm. on a high transaction. Well, that's where this applies even more because if you're not building trust in that phone call and you're over-educating, <laughs> that's the whole thing. What happens is people do free consulting a lot on those phone calls. Yeah. That's it. I know I've been guilty yeah. of that many a time. I mean, we're, we're definitely both guilty of that. <laughs> this is why we have a podcast, Ari. Right? We don't sell. Typically, we kind of sell pseudo sell. I guess, on the side. <laughs> but educate us. Let's, you know, let's kickstart this thing. And, and Yeah. Yeah. What it. happens a lot of times you get somebody on the phone and you know they have a problem you can solve and your gut says to yourself, oh, I, I can help you. Let, let me show what I've got. And then you start just to unload on them. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying, but you start to over-educate and give value. And, and then at the end of the call, they're like, wow, this is great. Let me think about it. And uh, we'll let you know. And you're like, what? I, I just, so, so my, uh, my ideas are very contrarian. My whole thought process is, is basically not to give value pre-sale, mm -hmm. but instead to provide clarity on their problem, not value on the solutions. What I discovered was that potential clients don't care about how you solve their problem. What they care about is if you're the one to solve it or not. Mm -hmm. So the entire time they're going, do I trust him? Do I trust him? Do I trust him? Not how it works or the features and benefits. See, we're so programmed and conditioned to kind of just educate on what we do, case studies, stories, demos, benefits. What happens is we're in our, in our head the entire time, we don't go into their world and going deep on their problem. So our whole system is based upon the idea that your goal is to unpack their problems like a doctor-patient relationship. Mm. So when the you go see a doctor, and, yeah, yeah so when you see a doctor and you say, my shoulder hurts, he, he goes, where is it there? Ah, oh, yeah, right there. Oh, he goes, okay, I think I know what it is. The problem is you got ligament issues, some blood vessels were a problem. Uh, here's a script and you know to go fix the problem. But what we do in sales, if you're conditioned the old way, is when we hear I got a shoulder pain, we say, hey, I've got the medicine for you. Here, you're going to love it. It's great. It'll solve your... And the guy's like, well, wait, we're missing something here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the missing piece of trust, which I've, I've been working on for many years. Awesome. Okay. So... Yeah, I guess, uh, well, what does that process look like then? So pre-sell, I guess, walk us through your framework and some, and, you know, some strategies we can, we can kind of try for ourselves. Sure. I mean, well, I mean, first of all, so in our own model, for instance, uh, we've developed for a consultant, the consulting side of the business, we developed what we call a trust box. Hmm. Okay. So another term for that is shock and awe box from all, all yeah, the yeah. Uh, world. Mm -hmm. But basically, we call it a trust box, right? And so our trust box gets sent to people in the mail in advance of a consultation with us to pre-frame the fact that we're not going to chase them. Mm -hmm. We're not going to follow up with them. We're not going to close them. We let them know in advance <laughs> that what they come to expect is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're not afraid. And I, I advise my clients to tell their clients this, that they are a trust-based firm. Meaning we don't chase people. We don't close people. We don't pursue people. We literally say that to people. We don't use any sales techniques that all of us hate. And we ask permission, are you okay with that? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I would say their guard is probably down. Right? <laughs> <For the most part. laughs> it's yeah. pretty much obliterated. Yes, yeah. And so now we create this bubble of trust with them, like kind of this space where they feel comfortable telling us the truth of where they stand, because that's the whole goal. See, what happens a lot of times, is, if you imagine an iceberg, right? Hmm. There's the top of the iceberg and below the iceberg. What happens a lot of times is we operate at the top of the iceberg with people. Like mm -hmm. they tell us, well, here are my problems. Here's what's going on in my business. And you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, I can help you with that. Yeah. And we stay up here at the top level. What we don't go is below the iceberg. And the other aspects where the real um, 
at admission the problems are and what the ROI is. So like, for, I'll give you an example. Someone says to you, yeah, I'm having trouble with my, with my, my sales aren't doing very well. Uh, and you might say, well, um, and here's, my, here's my phrase, tell me a little bit more about that. Hmm. So every time you hear someone tell you a problem that they have, you don't just say, oh, well, let me tell you how I can solve that. You say, tell me a little bit more about that. Mm-hmm. Then they start to open up to you in ways they wouldn't before. They start to go into details. You can ask questions like, well, how long has it been going on for? Uh, how much you've been losing because of that? And here's the key languaging I've developed. And this is the key that element flips this to a go, no or, go, or go or no go. And that is this. I, I say, let me ask you a question. Is this a priority for you to solve hmm. or is something you want to put in the back burner? Hmm. These are questions that no one asks. Yeah. No, no one sales. asks these questions. No one does because they're programmed to react when they hear the problem, they provide the solution. What they don't do is they don't, they don't get out of their own head and walk into the client's world and stay in there for a long time because the goal here is shift your mindset to go in their world and stay in there as long as you can mm. until they tell you the magic phrase, which is this, how can you help me? Mm. I love it. So you're, you're basically pulling, you know, you're extrapolating stuff. You're not pushing <laughs> and I can see I'm on the right track here. And then, and then essentially they're asking permission of you. <laughs> so the tables have just been flipped. Yeah, that, At that point they're essentially saying, okay, sell me something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> tell me, yeah. They're the ones moving forward. We mm. ought to pull them forward. See all that tension of, well, I they move forward. And, hey, let's go. Let, see, that's where we get stuck. We don't build trust with people. We create tension with them, but if you can stay in the world and have the right question to go deep with them and just be patient and stay in the moment with them, they're going to say to you one of two things, either how can you help me or how do you work? It's, it's so formulaic. It's amazing. And once they start mm-hmm. telling you that, then you can walk through what I call, uh, I developed my own piece of IP called a roadmap, a sales roadmap, where you walk somebody through a visual image of what your process is to solve their problem, not your solution to solve the problem. Mm. So for instance, let's just say you sell conversion software or, mm. or some tools online. See, m- most people do is they go, great, let me show you a demo. Yep. <laughs> with with in, no interaction, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you want to log in, I'll show you the, the demo right now. Because they don't care about the demo. They don't even want to see the demo. <laughs> I mean, think about it. A client's got a problem. What does he want? It's solved. He doesn't want to go through an opt-in page, a phone call, a demo, a follow-up email, and proposal. <laughs> we do as marketers, we put about a whole bunch of stuff in between that, but they don't want that. Yeah, right. Yeah. They just, want, I, I, like, they just want their problem solved. They don't want to deal with these opt-ins. And, but we do it because we're marketers. But if you think about it psychologically, all they want is someone they can trust to solve their problem. They don't want a demo. Promise you yeah. that. But they, they, but we think they do. So we're going to jump in. So instead, what you, you would basically do is walk them through a visual way to describe how you solve their problem, which we, we help work with clients on, where it's like a visual map that says, you know, phase one is we basically uh, do discovery phase, uncover your challenges and face. So kind of, there's ways of kind of architecting that call where you don't have to pitch your solution mm-hmm. or do free consulting. But that's, that's kind of the, the general model around those consultations. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I don't know what author said this. Maybe it was Stephen King. I'm not sure, but something to the effect of like most authors hate writing books, but they love having written a book, right? It's something to that effect. Um, and I, I kind of see what you're saying is the same thing. If, if, if I'm looking for a solution to a problem and you're demoing my, the software for me, you're showing me the writing the book. You're not showing me the book already being written. <laughs> uh, yeah, and a funny thing about that is that people who sell have a tendency to sell the future. They say, hey, if you get the software, you'll get this. If you'll get, imagine a year from now, we try and sell the future. People can't think past tomorrow right now. They can't. And we're yeah. selling the future. Oh, yeah, if you buy my solution, you'll have 25 new clients. Well, the guy can't think past the next 10 minutes. So we tell you, don't sell the future anymore. Focus on their current problems. Go deep on those. Have them help them articulate and amplify what those issues are. Have them admit to themselves they want to solve it, like a psychologist and a patient. You know, if you can't admit the problem, you're not going to solve it. No. It just, it just kind of it ends the chasing game. 
Mm-hmm. You can onboard somebody on one call. I've got a course coming out called the One Call Sale, where I'll be teaching this basically, how to, how to basically architect a phone call so it does not contain a sales pitch, but they mm-hmm. onboard with you without resistance. So the whole idea here is remove the pressure, build trust without you having to sell what you have. Yeah. So I, I have a question. So you mentioned you send out this, uh, this trust box, right? And then you also have the, this call. Um, h- how do you bridge that gap? Like from the, the trust box landing in their, their personal inbox at home to actually getting them on a call, like h- how do you bridge that? How do you get them on the call? Especially if you're telling them from the beginning, we're not going to sell you anything. We're not going to do any of that stuff you don't like. Yeah, yeah. So great question. So there's different models we have. One are people that are people who come in and literally ask for consultations. So they know they can be booked, but mm-hmm. there are some who don't, who will we get the box anyway. So the ones who are going to be booked, obviously they're going to get scheduled. But let me tell you one caveat on that. It mm-hmm. might help your listeners as well to do these phone calls is we never do an initial uh, call with someone on Zoom. Mm-hmm. We only do an audio call because on Zoom, you meet somebody for the first time half their brain looking at your hair and your background and the books <laughs> on right. your shelf and they're not focused. It's amazing how much you can, how awkward it can become after a while. So we don't even know on zoom. It's like, Oh, hi, nice to meet you. So we, we tell people only do the phone first. It's an audio track. It's one single track. You mm-hmm. listen, you ask questions and you can focus on that. So anyways, the languaging for the phone call that my team uses to call back about the boxes They simply call back and say, uh, I'm just giving you a call to see if you received the box that we sent you uh, in in the mail um, uh, last week. Mm -hmm. That's all they say. That's so so simple. (laughs) That's it. And the person goes, "Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. God, thank you so much. And they just say, that's great. Just want to make sure you got it okay. And they go, yeah, thank you so much. As if like the call's over. So they're Mm -hmm. relaxed. Yeah. Yeah. And then my my team just goes, okay, not a problem. I'm just curious. What was it that prompted you to, to an interest in trust-based selling? What was it about your situation right now that might be interested in that? What was it about your background that caused you to, to reach out to us? And then they just open up like a whole, like a dam opens up. They just tell, oh, well, this and that and this and that. And they simply say, look, if you, and here's the key languaging. If you'd be open to it, the word open. Mm-hmm. You're, that word, word open replaces the word interested. You use mm-hmm. the word open. If you'd be open to it, I'd be happy to see if we can arrange a conversation with one of our, one of our consultants to see if they can chat with you about that. Would you be open to that? So, mm. so the word open, see the beautiful thing of the word open is it doesn't force them into a yes or a no. You see, mm-hmm. it gives them room to kind of yeah. tell, tell you the truth. Mm-hmm. So we've optimized the languaging on, on these phrases to basically build that trust. They don't feel like they're being cornered or being pressured for a next step. Mm, that's, that's fascinating because that is, yeah, it's giving them permission with no real tension or friction. They're just like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm open to it. Exactly. It yeah. Yeah. So all the language we developed is all based on removing all the pressure out of the process. I'll give an example of that. Here's a great example. Mm-hmm. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you and your listeners to take an oath with me, a verbal oath, to remove <laughs> this phrase forever from your vocabulary. And for the guys on this phone or gals who have been in sales for a long time, this might hurt just a bit. Okay, <laughs> Go for it. I, I'm going to ask you to never again use the word follow-up ever again <laughs> in the sales process, ever again. Because mm. what's the only industry in the world that uses the word follow-up? Sales. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right? You <laughs> sales follow-up. They say, hi, I'm giving you follow-up. They're like, oh, he's calling to chase me. So... There's a classic, there's a few other classic ones like touch base and what else is there? Checking there's in. Cir- circle back. Or, circle or I back, guess yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yep. You replace all that with this one instead. You say, I'm just giving you a call to see if you have any feedback. Mm. Any feedback on our previous conversation. Any feedback on our proposal. Any feedback on our last meeting. See, feedback goes backwards away from the sale. Mm. And that takes the pressure out. And what happens, it's fascinating. What happens is they just start telling you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> it's a magic. That, I mean, that's, that's your, it, it just sounds like everything you're doing is just putting the guard down. They're open. They're, they're accepting whatever you have to come, but you're letting them leave. And you're avoiding putting any pressure at any point in the process on them. Right. <laughs> By consciously removing the pressure from the process, you're sending a message. Mm-hmm. You're saying, I'm not going to play that game. 
Yeah. And I'm not going to do anything to you that you don't want to do. So you just, just, you can trust me to tell me the truth. I'm okay. If it's a yes or a no, I'll walk away at any mm-hmm. moment. If we're not a fit, because my whole thing is about a fit. And I would say to somebody or my clients would say to somebody, look, if we're not a fit, I'm okay with that. Just that alone <laughs> is like, whoa. Yeah. In and a now, world where no one is thinking this, whether they're, they're push, 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 or, or too quick, like trying to close the deal right now, like not, not seeing things through a relationship wise. Have you heard of Aikido, the martial art, Japanese martial art mm-hmm. called Aikido? Uh-huh. Yep. And, and karate, uh, karate is more linear. When someone comes at you, you attack back. You, it's, you push against resistance against resistance. With Aikido, if someone comes at you, you kind of divert their energy, uh, uh, redirect it. Mm-hmm. So no one gets hurt at the end of that. And this, I adopted uh, this Aikido underneath my philosophy where you use languaging not to overcome resistance. You diffuse resistance, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I'll give you an example. So I've got a whole body of work around objections and this was some fun stuff here. So yeah. let's do a classic one. Let's say someone, you know, if someone says, you know, I know you don't do sales. Let's just say someone said your, your price is too high uh-huh. or your fee is too high. You're selling consulting. You know, what's the typical reaction to that, that you would imagine people would say to that if your fee is too high, how people react to that typically? Yeah, I can't afford it right now or it's not in the budget. My wife said right. no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or the person would say, well, look, we're, we're better. We can help you with that. We're trying to overcome it. So in our world, we don't overcome objections. We diffuse them. So if someone says in our world, you know, your price is too high, what we say is you're absolutely right. It can be, here it is, it can be perceived as high. If you haven't had a chance to actually use the software, get the results you want, you're absolutely right. From the outside in, it can be seen that way. Mm. You see, mm. that's true. The truth mm. is, it, from the outside in, it's perceived as high. So we have languaging that diffuses all that resistance that kind of melts away the moment. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I feel like you're just, I'm, I'm sure you, you've, uh, you've scientifically like figured out any kind of uh, pressure point, I guess. You know, it's like, hey, all right, that one. How do we, mm. how do we basically invert yeah. that like, so we, i don't know if, <laughs> go ahead well i was gonna say i i don't know if i should say this publicly on the podcast <laughs> but when when somebody's like pitching me on a sales call like pretty much the end of the, every call the way i i get out of the call is well i've got a business partner so um <laughs> let me let me uh confer with my business partner and i'll get back to you on that one that's my way out every single sales call that's why joe and i never get on sales calls at the same time <laughs> so how would you how would you go about that so Art? what's the diffusion <laughs> for something like that a partner. So, so, well, let's, let's role play that one. Okay. That, that's, a, that's a classic one is that mm. people use that to avoid being chased and, mm-hmm. and put pressure on. That's, that's, that's the problem with that, that problem. But uh, so let's role play a little bit. So why don't you kind of tell me what you just said to me? So, yeah, I mean, everything is looking, I, and I do the same thing you were talking about earlier. Well, I'll, I'll kind of give them a little bit of hope, even though in my mind, I know this thing's probably not going to happen, which when you brought that up, I'm like, I never thought about it, but that's very mm-hmm. true. So um, the way I would probably in the conversation is like, yeah, this sounds, this sounds promising. This sounds pretty good. Let me just have a chat with my business partner and I'll get back to you on it. Not a problem. Not a problem at all. That's fine. It sounds good. Cool. So that's, I, that's, I, I, it's just really not an objection that's that's worth trying to battle against, I guess, right? Hold on, I'm not, I'm not done yet. Okay. Just start <laughs> <laughs> so that's one key. When I say that's not a problem, mm-hmm. what that does is diffuses the resistance, you see? You, you back away and go, oh, good, he accepted it. See, so when you say that's not, when I say it's not a problem, that creates space mm. to allow me to re-engage again, you see? So I said to you, it's not a problem. You go, oh, good. And then I, and we paused and then I, and I'll say next to you next. So that's not a problem. It's not a problem at all. And I'll wait a moment, let it breathe because there's a lot of tension there mm-hmm. and to stay calm. And I would say, well, not a problem. Uh, what, what kind of questions do you anticipate your partner might have around this? That I can possibly help you with. Well, uh, we just need to make sure that uh, this makes sense within the context of our, our budget right now. And I need to confer with him to get an accurate number on, you know, what we can put into something like this right now. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. No problem at all. Well, wh- wh- where do you think we should go from here? 
Oh. But it's, 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 it's tough for a second. But I, I'm giving you some key phrases here. Yes, that, I like that, that though. What well, got you more, thinking? Like, <laughs> well, the, 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 what I really liked about what you just said at the end there is now you're sort of putting the ball in my court to tell me when I'll follow up with you. <laughs> the whole goal is putting the ball on their court the entire time, so they don't feel like I'm. We're trying to pressure them to make a decision because if you own the the moment then you've got to figure out where to go from here. I'm not going to sort of just back off and, you know, I yeah. mean, I'm not going to hang in there, but the point is I'm telling you through my languaging, you, it's okay. You can tell me the truth. I'm okay with the no. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I like that a lot. <laughs> that is, I mean, you're, you're literally putting him in the driver's seat. Yeah. You as a, or, or the salesperson or whoever, you're just, you're just guiding. Yeah. It's, it's like, you know, you're just, you're, you're supporting them in their choices but that's just building trust along the entire journey. See, what I discovered is that to differentiate your business, it's hard to differentiate on your product anymore. It's so commoditized out there. Everyone's got the similar products, but you, if you differentiate your sales process and that becomes your innovation, you're different with people and the way you communicate with them, that becomes your category of one differentiation. Mm. The way in which you treat people in your pre-sale process becomes your differentiation, not your solution. Yeah. So the approach is so different and unique that when people feel that from you in your process, they can't help but to kind of just engage. If they mm. feel like there's marketing coming at them heavy and hard, they're shutting down. Mm -hmm. This is interesting. This is fascinating. I, I, I just, I think a lot of us just, and I know, I, weird example, but I was just looking through my emails yesterday and you know, there's certain people you just kind of really like, ah, I'll just wait every day. All right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, ah, it's not a priority right now. And some of those get pushed off for a while. <laughs> but then I had this like realization yesterday. I was like, what are like, what if I just said like straight up, like top of mind, what I think like, Nope, don't think it's a good fit. And then like, start, just start axing away at these in a night helpful, a ha happy way, you know, and, and <laughs> not being a jerk about it, but screw you got my inbox. No, but I was thinking about, it, I'm like, man, this like, cause this will weigh on all of it. You know, if there's something that's undone or someone's at like, why not just be honest? Mm -hmm. And you see it, like you said, like, oh yeah, we'll definitely follow up. We're definitely, yeah, we'll, we'll circle back. We'll do all this stuff. And I'm never going to use this, sorry, uh, <laughs> but in context example, but why, yeah, why string people along? We're just, let them set them off to somewhere else. There's millions of people, billions of people on this planet. So um, yeah, I, that was just I'll a one you, example. I'll, 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 tell story about, I'll tell you a story about that actually. Sure. Uh, I had a guy recently call my office, <clears throat> got through my team, got to me on a scheduled phone call. You know, I picked it up. He goes, uh, Mr. Gelfer? I said, yeah. He goes, my name is Mike Johnson. I've changed the name. It's a big company. He says, uh, sure. I'm with XYZ Company. We're looking to bring someone to change our sales process and our, our company thinking. We're looking at you and two other people. Uh, we'd like to know, first of all, uh, why should we go with you? Uh, why are you the best? And give me your best sales pitch. <laughs> he says this to me. <laughs> You're like, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I took a deep breath. I'm a human being, too. It was a big company. I just stayed calm, lowered my voice, and I said to him, well, isn't that interesting? Hmm. And I just paused. And I said, because over here at our company, we have a very similar process to you, where we ask a couple of questions, see if we're a good fit together. And if we're a good fit, we decide where to go from there. And I said to him, would you be open to that? Mm -hmm. And then I didn't hear a word. I'm like, Jesus, still there. <laughs> then then he, I could help the breath. Like, like he breathed across the phone. Like <sighs> he lowers his voice and he says, oh, okay. Um, what, what kind of questions do you have for me? Next thing I know, in five minutes, I discover one, he's not a decision maker. Two, he has no budget. And three, he's just curious as to what I do. <laughs> And after five minutes, he hung, off he went to YouTube for some of my stuff and I hung up the phone and that just saved me months and months of what I call hopium. You know, hopium? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hopium is dr yeah, the ahead. drug that we get in the inbound calls where you go, oh yeah, I got the call, honey. This is the year feed you this year. Like, and you're excited and you call them back and you chase them and you hope they're going to call you and then never ends up going anywhere. Mm -hmm. So this, my process is detox for hopium, basically. 
<laughs> I think it's a great process. And this is something where I can see it, it layered in, in things like emails, you know, sequence, uh, oh, yeah. maybe through surveys, through asking them specific questions to get mm -hmm. some, some data straight from the horse's mouth. Quote, unquote. Yeah. So on the marketing side, on autoresponders and all that, see what usually goes in there is content around the solution. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. See, so our, we teach our clients that you, you do not use your solution content pre in your autoresponders. Instead, you put in there, you describe their issues and problems in ways they can't describe themselves. Mm -hmm. They got to feel you understand their issue, their world. And in such a deep way, they resonate with your message. They're not being sold the solution because it's too premature to offer the solution before they resonate with you knowing their problem. Mm, yep. So we separate marketing content pre-sale and post-sale. And pre-sale is only problem-based content, not solution-based content. Mm, which changes head, that changes headlines, changes ad copy, that changes all the content pre-marketing away from the solution, which is it's so countercultural to even say that. Because we're taught to basically deliver content, value, keep giving them more, hmm. but they don't want more. We're they up to our eyes. We're like, we're all at home or, or wherever watching Netflix and other YouTube. <laughs> time. Like we got enough content. We're good. We need problem solved now. <laughs> Come on. The world doesn't need more content. No. Yep. <laughs> You're right. Dang it. Should we go to a one day a week show, man? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last episode of this podcast. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm not happy. No, I think this, this is absolutely fascinating. And um, just one other thing I picked up on from you is breathing and pausing and, and all of that. Can you? Yeah. I'm go so forward. glad you just noticed that. Yeah. Because what triggers rejection and, and pressure of people is half is it languaging and half is delivery. Hmm. This is verbal. So if you start talking fast, like, hey, well, the energy and the momentum makes their guard go up. Mm -hmm. But when you slow things down, I know it sounds almost super slow when I slow things down because we're not used to that. You guys are kind of quick like me. We all talk kind of quick. We are quick. <laughs> yeah. We're internet guys, you know, that's why I'm from my background. But when you're talking to somebody on the phone who could be a potential client, when you slow things down and create pauses, what happens is, they naturally want to engage in those pauses. It draws people into you when you slow things down and you pause. If you speed things up, which we do naturally when we feel like our opportunities there, we can't help it. We kind of, oh, great. How about we, that it's over. You've lost them because they can sense that you're moving them to a next step. You see? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When they feel you're present with them in the moment and you're not moving to a next step, that's when they release themselves to tell you the truth. The minute you start to move things forward prior to that, you've lost them. Even though it sounds like they're, they're going to buy something, good luck chasing them. Mm -hmm. That's so fair. our whole thing is, our whole thing is no chasing ever again by, by end running that process earlier on in the model. So you don't have to end up chasing ghosts, people who tell you yes, but they're not going to go anywhere. Mm. It's happened far too many times for me. I know mm -hmm. a lot of other folks <laughs> that are listening and I, I, this is just such, I'm not going to call it simple, but it's very, <laughs> it's obvious, but not obvious things to just modify and tweak. It's they're tweaks more than like, here's a brand new strategy. It's, yeah. Now it's not an incremental uh, tactics to make things better. What you're doing right now, it's a wholesale right. shift and letting go of your mindset of focusing on the end goal. That's the, mm -hmm. that's the key piece of the mindset. But they're also languaging to activate this. I'll give you an example of this, which would be helpful for, for your listeners. Sure. Let's, let's do a real scenario. Let's say you're having like a first call with somebody over the phone. Say you're mm -hmm. self-consulting or something. And a first call and you're having a chat with them on the phone. It's a good opportunity. You can tell it's like a good, could be turned to something well, really well. And kind of call, call comes to a close. Usually in a normal model, we'd say, well, hey, great. Thank you so much. Let's, let's schedule another call. Let's, let's have a cup of coffee. Let, let's move things where? Mm. Forward, 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 always forward. Yeah, right. But what happens if you move somebody forward and they aren't ready yet? What do you yeah. break right there at the beginning? Trust. Exactly. You break yeah. the trust. So, same scenario. Our model: call is going well, good opportunity. Call comes to a close. Rather than saying, "Hey, how about we move forward?" What we say instead is this: we say, 
where do you think we should go from here? Mm. And I'll say it again. Where do you think we should go from here? Yeah. And you, know what's cra- you know what's crazy about that? When you deliver it that way to somebody, first of all, they're usually in a state of shock. Totally. <laughs> yep. Total shock. <laughs> like, they, what do I do with that? <laughs> they, they, they're not used to being treated like a human being. They're used to being like a target, right? They're not used to somebody humanizing the conversation. It's like, it's like, whoa. Mm-hmm. And then what happens is here's the funny. They start telling you the truth. They say things like, well, I, I, I've got one more question. Well, what about, and all, it all mm-hmm. starts coming out that hello. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm sure much more personal too. Like these deeper layers, you get lower down. It's not the sur- it's not the tip of the iceberg. So. Yeah, you go down the iceberg at the beginning of your process. You're not wondering at the end what happened anymore. Because mm. usually at the end, you manage your pipeline with deals that are pending, and they either fall out or they come through. And you're wondering what happened at the end. You're like, oh no, guys, you lost it at hello, not at the end. Mm-hmm. Man, all right. Well, do you have anything else? I- I've there was a lot there and I love it. I know, it. I'm, I'm, I'm twisting your guys' heads back and forth a couple of times. But <laughs> no, these this, are the best of episodes though. Those are the ones that well, leave the impact. Well, I was just, in my, in my mind, I'm thinking about like the, the last handful of sort of sales calls I've been on where somebody was selling me something. Uh-huh. And I'm, I'm kind of thinking of like the variables where they, you know, they closed the deal versus didn't close the deal. And in almost every scenario I can think of, nobody's ever really closed the deal with me like on that first meeting. Like this is the first time I've ever talked to you. You reached out cold, we got on a call and they closed the sale. I can't even think of a time that that's happened. Almost all the times where we bought something that was like quote unquote higher ticket, right? Let's say a thousand dollars plus. It's always been a scenario where we built a relationship. We had a few emails back and forth. Maybe we had a call with no expectations. We were just kind of chatting and, Mm. you know, getting to know each other. And then eventually I came around and realized, I think I'm ready for their service. And then I reached out and said, Hey, let's get on that, that, that call. I want to know more about what you can offer. And just thinking through how we've logically bought things and, re- and you essentially just reverse engineered that for me. <laughs> that is so interesting what you just described to me, because that's based upon the model or the salesperson that thinks their goal is to build a relationship first before a sale can happen. Right. What we discovered in our research is you don't have to build a relationship first to create trust with people. Hmm. You can create trust with people without a pre-existing relationship. That's a radical thought because yeah. that will compress sales cycles. That compresses yeah. everything because we've been taught to believe, hey, we got the, how's it going? Great. Nice to meet you. We're like, we're trying to like build rapport and like this, what happens is social norms are created. We become mm-hmm. their friend. When you become their friend, and no longer is there a, a next step in the process that's obligatory or they don't want to ask you because you're a friend. So what I mm. share with my clients is do not, tr- and this sounds totally radical, I know, mm. I'm warning in advance, mm. do not attempt to build a relationship with somebody pre-sale, but mm. instead focus on their problem, diagnose it, have them see you as an authority, and then build trust that direction. And believe me, that will shave years and time and heartache off of chasing these people never come through. Mm. That is completely radical and makes so much sense <laughs> at the same time. I mean, it's, it's, it's so true. Because I know I, I default to build rapport, have a relationship, maybe become a friend of these folks, uh, my clients. And, you know, and I know, yeah, it's tough to take them to the next level or present them something where, you know, you know, maybe it's, I don't know, it, it feels like it gets murky, you know, when there's well, a, well, well, a once they're on, there. Once they're on board post-sale, then mm-hmm. sure. Mm. Be their friend, go golfing, I don't care, whatever. You, but that's, that's after they're on board, not before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. like before, it's, it's just kind of a fake awkwardness that you're trying to build rapport with someone. Doesn't mean, you're not even their friend anyways. You don't know them. You're, it's a customer. It's a different relationship. We've been taught. Uh, it's a quick story for you guys. Um, mm-hmm. I spoke uh, before COVID at a uh, 500-person networking. Uh, I was a keynoter in Sydney, mm-hmm. uh, and I think it was in February or something. And the 500 people in the room, big networking kind of group. Yeah. And after my talk, people came up to me and said, hey, I like your stuff. And, and they told me confidentially that they know everybody in the room, but they aren't making any sales. 
Mm. I said, well, what do you, you get 500 mm. people that you're networking now? Yeah, but I know them all. They know, know me. We have a relationship with them, but no one's buying. I said, well, that's the problem. You're trying to build a relationship first before focusing on their problem. It, it's just a radical shift in how we've been taught to believe that sales actually happen. Mm. You know? Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm going to think hard on these <laughs> because they're, yeah, just, just simple. Just swapping words out is just a big enough radical change, but just mm-hmm. all the kind of just inverting some of these pre-existing thoughts uh, along the whole sale, pre-sales cycle uh, will definitely change everything and exponentially grow and bring our time back as well. Yep. See what this does is it flips the numbers game concept. You know how sales is a numbers game idea. Yep. Yep. The idea is we've been taught over the years that the more contacts you make, the more sales you make. Sure. Yep. This, re- this reverses that. So less volume, higher conversion. Mm. That sounds good to me. <laughs> I'm good with that. Well, Ari, uh, let's, let's wrap this up. And how can folks uh, dive deeper into your frameworks? I know you're working on a training as well, it sounds like. Yeah, I would just go to unlockthegame.com, just like it sounds. And uh, mm-hmm. I've got a, a Mastery in the Mindset course they can get access to. I have a new course coming out called the One Call Sale, which will basically take what we talked about and kind of put into a, a, a program as well. And I'm watching the course all the time. So I think as long as you're open-minded, to let go of what you're used to doing because the world has changed. If you don't adapt to, I, I think I believe that trust will become the new currency mm-hmm. of how business is being done in the new economy. And if you don't change the way you approach your market on a trust-based model, you're playing the numbers game and it's tough. I would agree with that hundred percent. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll link that in the show notes for you guys listening and, uh, and make sure that you guys get that. Ari, thank you so very much. Yeah, this, this has been, been amazing. Mind blowing. And <laughs> again, those are always the best episodes. <laughs> so been a pleasure you. guys. Thank you so much. 